Hello everyone, I would like to welcome you to the first lecture in our course Nginx from Zero to Hero from Idionics. My name is Ahmed and in this first section of the course we are going to have a brief introduction to the web server in general, the HTTP protocol and where Nginx fits in this world. Now let's have a visit to a website and let's see and let's say it's google.com open up your browser and go to www.google.com in a few seconds the google homepage appears but within you typing the url pressing enter and the page appearing lots of things have happened a request was initiated by your browser leaving your local network traversing the global network or the internet as it is called till it reaches one of the computers which are assigned with serving google's homepage that computer the one that was serving the Google's homepage in return initiates a response containing the contents of the requested page. This response takes a similar route through the internet till it reaches your local network and finally your computer's browser. The computer that was tasked with serving you this web page is called a web server. Of course, all of you are familiar with web servers. All of you have visited the internet at least once, I hope. And I assume you have a good idea about what our server is, but let's see the details that some of you might not be aware of. When you issued the request to visit the Google web page by typing www.google.com in your browser, and when you receive the response, this request and response, in order for them to be successful, in order for them to display the page the way you saw it on your screen, on your browser, or on your mobile device, if you are using a cell phone or a tablet, this is called the HTTP protocol. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. A protocol in IT jargon refers to a set of rules that are agreed upon between two or more parties for communication. When you requested www.google.com, you initiated an HTTP GET request. The request that you have called in HTTP language is called a GET request. You are asking the server that you want to get a page that resides on the file system somewhere on that server. When the web server receives this request, it knows that it should reply with a response containing the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, and any other components that happen to be on the page. Your browser is responsible for interpreting this data and displaying it in a proper manner. By default, the HTTP protocol is served on port 80 of the web server. And if you are not aware of ports, a port is just a window from which the server accepts connections. Just think of it as a window in your house. If you want air and sun to enter the house, you will have to open a window in your room or where you are sitting. But imagine that you have several windows in your house. And imagine that you have different types of things that you want to receive through those windows. Perhaps some people want to talk to you through the windows. They are standing outside your home and they want to talk to you through these windows. So you will need to know which person can talk to you through which window. So you numbered your windows, let's say from one to 10, if you have 10 windows, and then you say, okay, I want to talk to Joe. I'm gonna talk to him on window number five. I wanna talk to Mary. I can talk to her on window number nine and so on and so forth. In computer networking, this is done through something called ports. A port is just a window on the server, on the computer, it agrees or it specifies that this port will be used to receive that sort of connection, that sort of communication. In HTTP world, this window or this port by default is port 80. And this port may be easily changed. And many web servers actually do this for reasons of security and for other reasons. Like for example, if there is already another window or another port that is already open for some other application and it's already listening or already accepting connections on port 80, this port can be changed to another port and it will act as perfect and as efficient as port 80. So, so, the, so the number here is just a number, it's useless. It's just a default number that is agreed upon by the HTTP developers around the world and by developers that this port will be used for HTTP connections. Nothing more, nothing less. In the coming lab, or in the coming mini lab, let's examine this operation in a little more detail. So what we're gonna do now is that I'm going to open my internet browser in this lab, I'm going to use Mozilla Firefox, but you can use Google Chrome or whatever browser you favor like 
Safari for Mac or Opera or whatever browser. I just happen to be using here Firefox as my personal preference in browsers. I'm going to open my browser and before I do anything, I want to enable the inspector window. So I'm going to go to the developers or the developer tools here from this window as you can see and I'm going to click on inspector and I'm going to choose the network tab which is the last tab here in this console and in the browser I'm going to type the URL of WordPress so it's www.wordpress.org WordPress of course is a very famous CMS framework and blog application it is very famous I'm going to visit this website and I'm going to have a look here at the network tab and the several information that has filled the screen here the network tab in the browser and you have a similar functionality in Google Chrome I think it's called also the, the developer tab you can just right click anywhere on the page and close and choose inspect element and it will open to you a similar window as this one with a tab that is called network okay let's have a look here at the network and as you can see here I have several lines of information we have here a status we have here a method we have here some sort of an address and a domain and the cause and a type and so on and so much other information let's concentrate here on the status and the method for example as you can see here I have a status of 301 status of 200 status of 206 okay and 304 the status is basically the response that I got from the web server when I issued my request when I called wordpress.org my browser issued a request as we have just discussed to the web server that is responsible for receiving requests web requests that are requesting the website www.wordpress.org so the first time I issued this request I received a status of 301 later on we will learn that 301 is a redirect request it's just informing the browser that it has to go somewhere else in order to download or view the requested web page so as you can see here i was requesting www.wordpress.org and i ended up going to wordpress.org without the www at the start of the url this is because this status was returned to the browser by the web server and as you can see here firefox is even giving us the meaning of this status code 301 move permanently and if i have the status of 200 this means okay this means that my request has been served and that i am ready to receive the answer or the response from the web server in this case it is the web page or a document that is serving wordpress.org and if i click on this request as you can see here on the right hand side of the screen let's get this a little clearer and as you can see here i have response headers these are part of the HTTP protocol. These are some metadata about the response object that I received. The response object is just a way to say the container that contained the data that I want to receive, the HTML of this page, those colors, those fonts, this JavaScript that makes this happen, the, the, the menu, those drop down menus and all these things all this is the content of the page that have been received through those headers so have a look here at the response headers that I have in my response I have content encoding is gzip this means that the web server is telling me that it has compressed the content that it is serving for better performance of course and that I must decompress this content in order to be displayed on the screen and the browser must have this information ready otherwise it won't be able to display the information or the data of the web page clearly i also have content type text slash html this means that i am receiving an html content because as you know and of course if you have already experienced it web browsers can be used to also download files not only display web pages so for example may download an mp3 or a video file or an iso file if you are installing something and you download the source file for it this content type in that case will be different it won't be text over html it will be like for example an image or a binary data or some other text that indicates to the browser that it shouldn't display the contents of this file on the screen rather it has to download it or do something else with it next we have the date 
Next, we have the server. And this is very important here to notice. The server here is Nginx. That is because this website, WordPress.org, is using Nginx, the topic of our course, as the web server that is used to serve all this content. Okay. So as you can see here, I have so much information that can be grabbed from the network tab of the inspector tool of Firefox. And I think every modern browser now has a, thi has a thing like this. In Chrome, you have it in Safari and Opera. All the major browsers have this sort of functionality where you can discover and, exp and examine the various requests and responses that have been received by your browser. So what is a web server in a little more detail? Well, technically, a web server is any computer that has a running daemon, and a daemon is just a name to call a service running in the background. Whenever you have a service running in the background and your operating system is a Linux or a Unix or a Unix-like system like Mac, it is called a daemon. This daemon or this service accepts HTTP requests on some port, and by default, this port is 80, and it replies with also HTTP responses. This is typically HTML content, but of course, this can be something else, like you can you can serve whatever files you need, you can serve videos, you can serve images, you can serve whatever files you need, but in, more, in most cases, this is just plain HTML, occasionally with some other mixed content like CSS, JavaScript, and of course, images. So serving just HTML, as we said, along with images, JS, and CSS, is serving static content. That is content that does not change from one user or condition to another. Nowadays, this is very rare. If you have worked with WordPress before, or if you have worked with any CMS, which is short for Content Management System, you will notice that a lot of what you see on the screen is dynamic. This means that it changes from one visit to another and from one user to another. If you are the administrator of the website, you see some content. If you are a normal user, you see a totally different content. If you are a guest, you will see a third type of content and so on and so forth. This is done by what's called dynamic content. And to differentiate between dynamic content and static content, let's give this example. Let's say that you have a website that contains like 10 files, file 1, file 2, file 3, file 4, file 4, and so on till you reach file 10.html. Now, the user that visits this website, all what it is presented with is a list of files that it can reach to. So, if the user clicks on file1.html on a link or typed www.example.com slash file1.html, he or she will just receive the contents of this file. Whether he is the administrator, whether he is a normal user, whether he is a search engine bot, Whatever he is, the web server won't care. It will just serve the contents of this static file. However, if you are working with a programming language like Ruby or PHP or Python or ESP.NET or any of the amazing web development languages that are available today, you will have the ability to serve different content depending on so much conditions that you can fine tune your website or in other words, it's called now a web application because it uses a dynamic language or a web development language, you can, for example, present the user with a login page if the page that he or she is trying to access is protected. You can use this language, for example, to make a shopping cart where the user can add items to the shopping cart and then check out and then pay with his or her credit card and so on and so forth. All these things are not possible with static files. All these things are possible only if you use dynamic content using a web development language like the ones we have just stated. The web server does this by handing the requests to an application handler. If you are using PHP or Ruby or ASP.NET, this these are all integrated in some way or another with the web server so that when the web server receives a request that is intended to be served by this dynamic content language, like for example, if the web server sends it that the user is accessing a page that is ending in .php, it automatically recognizes that it cannot serve this page. It cannot serve a page that is called, like for example, index.php. No, it will take this page, sends it to the interpreter of the application, like for example, the PHP interpreter, and this interpreter will process the page 
extract information from the page, do whatever is needed, like for example, contact the database or do whatever it needs to do, and then sends the web server the processed HTML together with any images or CSS or JavaScript, and then the web server takes this HTML and presented it and presented back to the client. Lots of web servers are available in the market today. Microsoft Internet Information Services, for example, Apache, and of course Nginx are among those web servers. And of course, the topic of this course is Nginx. In the next lecture, we are going to see in a little more detail what Nginx is, where it fits in the world of web servers, and why ever should we be using it. So, see you next. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a new lecture in your course Nginx from Zero to Hero by Idionix. My name is Ahmed, and in this section, we are going to delve more into what Nginx is, why you should use it, what is the difference between it and other web servers in the market. So, let's get started. Nginx, pronounced as Nginx, of course, if you're reading this and not listening to me and you haven't seen before Nginx written, you may be wondering how it is pro how it is pronounced. Well, it is pronounced Nginx, like the N, and then Ginx. It is a web server developed by Igor Sisoev in 2002. It was officially released in 2004. According to the official website www.nginx.org, it is defined as an HTTP and reverse proxy server, a mail proxy server, and a generic TCP UDP proxy server. And as per Netcraft, which is a website that is considered with collecting statistical information about different web trends and web servers and types of browsers that are surfing the net, and in addition to other statistics, Netcraft says that Internex has served or proxied more than 28% of the busiest websites in February 2017, and that is considerably a large number. Nginx is a powerful web server that is capable of doing lots of complex stuff. Let's see why you should be using it. And I guess that is a question that you shouldn't be asking yourself now if you have decided to take this course. However, you have to realize the power of Nginx, what it is good for, and where you should use it before starting to use it. Now, why should I be using Nginx? Notice how I chose the word using Nginx instead of the word switching to Nginx. That is because you don't have to drop your existing web server or to totally change your infrastructure to enjoy the power of Nginx. It can nicely fit into your setup and enhance it. Nginx provides, first of all, speed. Now, who wants a slow loading page? Today, a user cannot wait more than two seconds to see a fully loaded page. Otherwise, you start losing visitors. You know, now, 10 years ago, this number was much higher. If I have a look here at this graph that is actually taken from the nginx.org website, have a look here at this graph. In 1993, which is like more than 20 years ago, users could wait for a web page to load for up to 10 seconds without leaving it. They were patient enough to wait for a page to load and that load time may reach up to 10 seconds. Now imagine 10 seconds now, I want you to hold the timer and to type in the address of a, of a website that you know it's a slow one and, and that it's loaded with graphics and you know, like flash objects and so on and so forth that it takes a considerably long time to load. And I want you to, and I want you to measure the amount of time that this web page took to be fully loaded and how much impatient you turn to be when you, are, when you are waiting for this page to full load. I bet you're going to wait more than five seconds before you start to get bored and start closing the browser window or to switch on to something else. And that is of course because of the huge number of websites that are available now on the internet. 20 years ago or more, the number of websites that were available were so limited compared to the ones that are available now. If you were, for example, searching for pets, you want information about a specific type of pet or a dog, for example, you'll find literally thousands of websites that are, that are all giving you the information that you need. 20 years ago or 25 years ago, that was not the case. Maybe a handful of web pages or a handful of websites had this information. So you had to wait as a user for this web page to load because you know that not all the other websites will have a similar load time, but also you don't have that much of choice. So you have to load for a web page to do its work and provide you with the information you need. Nowadays, you would not wait more than two seconds as this graph depicts before you start leaving this page and looking for some other web page that would provide the same information that you need or even better. The competition is so hard compared with 
1993 or the early 90s or even the early 2000s. And also the page weight has dramatically increased. In, 1990, in, in 1995, as you can see, the page barely reached maybe like 10 kilobytes, as you can see here in this graph. It was so small in size. And as years have passed, let's have a look here at 2003, you barely reached 400 kilobytes of web page size. Nowadays, and this graph is a little old, it is ending at 2014, maybe now the web pages, we are now in 2017, maybe the web pages have increased in size dramatically. Uh, as I can see from the slope of this graph, maybe it's now, it, maybe it now has hit or passed the two megabytes limit. So what I want to say now is that web pages are becoming larger in size with lots of components, lots of JavaScript, lots of CSS, lots of even HTML that web servers now need to serve those pages not only as fast as possible and in less than two seconds, but also they have to work with a page with that size. So imagine now that you have a web server and you need this web server to serve a page that is more than two megabytes of size in less than two seconds. That's a big challenge. So speed is one of the things that Nginx excels at more than any other web server in the market. The second thing is acceleration. If you already have two or more web servers running the same application, Nginx can accelerate performance by routing traffic to those web servers in a way that enhances the overall speed. And this is one of the things that Nginx is amazing at doing. It cannot only serve as a web server, but it can also be integrated into your existing environment. If you have already a farm of web servers, like four or five web servers, you can add Nginx to those web servers, not as a new web server, but as something called a reverse proxy. A reverse proxy is just a device or a service that receives requests from the client on behalf of the backend web server, on behalf of the real web server. It takes this request and it is responsible for handing it to the appropriate backend web server. And when the web server is done processing it and sends the result to the Nginx, Nginx is responsible for handing this request back to the client. This enhances performance because it involves caching and it involves other algorithms that, that dramatically increases the speed the web page is served. And if you are and if you are working with a web with a web application that needs to do a lot of processing, you are just lifting the load of the web server or a part of the load of the web server and handing it to Nginx. So of course this provides more acceleration. The third reason here why you should be using Nginx is load balancing. A load balancer is a device or a service that distributes traffic load on two or more web servers. Now, if you have an environment that has lots of hits per day, like thousands of hits per day, you may decide that one web server is not enough for serving that amount of visitors. You need to buy another web server in order to share part of the load of the first one. However, if you buy another web server, how are the requests going to be routed from to this one and that one in a load balancing manner? That is the job or the task of a load balancer. A load balancer may be a hardware load balancer or a software load balancer. And Nginx excels also in this task. It can work as a load balancer to route the traffic to different web servers at the back end in a manner or in an algorithm that will ensure the maximum performance and will ensure that web servers are taking their fair share of traffic so that no lagging occurs. The fourth reason is scalable concurrent connection handling. Traditional web servers like Apache and IIS can serve incoming requests without a problem until the number of concurrent requests reaches a certain limit, like for example 1000 hits. And when I say concurrent connections, I mean the number of connections that are actively using the server at the same time. So the number here, the number 1000 here does not refer to the number of hits that this server is taking per day. Rather, it is referring to the number of connections that are all using the, the server resources at the same time. This means that I have 1000 visitors all visiting this very same web server at the very same time, at the very same second. Whenever this number rises, performance starts to degrade. That's because the way those servers were designed and the model by which they serve web requests. Unfortunately, increasing the installed, the installed CPU cores and RAM will not give you the intended results. So if 4 gigabytes of RAM are sufficient to serve 1000 concurrent connections or concurrent requests, if you double this number to 8 gigabytes, that will not enable the server to handle 2000 connections at the same time. And that is 
where engine X comes in. Engine X does not suffer from this problem and it can easily handle increasing number of concurrent requests without a problem and without you having to increase the hardware that you have currently installed. The next thing is the ability to operate a relatively cheap hardware. Yes, Nginx can be deployed on servers with very limited hardware capabilities and still perform much better than its counterparts on the same hardware. Next is on-the-fly upgrades. Nginx is one of the very few systems that can be patched or upgraded without having to take a downtime and disrupt your business. Well, personally, I would use Nginx for my environment just for that reason. Imagine now that you have an environment where lots of users are using your web application or your website and suddenly you want to patch the server or upgrade it. And when you have a server serving visitors from, from around the world, you cannot just take down the server for maintenance any time of the day. You are raking 24 by 7, 7 days a week. There is no less busy time. The whole day is busy, the whole 24 hours are busy, and you cannot just take down the web server for any reason, like maintenance, patching, or upgrading. This will cost you money. Internex solves this problem for you by allowing you to make any necessary patches or upgrades without disrupting your service. Nginx will just continue working when you patch it. While you are patching it or upgrading it, you will not lose a single second of business. And last thing is ease of installation and maintenance. As we move on, you will find that Nginx is relatively easier than you think when it comes to basic and even advanced usage. Now, in the coming lecture, we are going to see what can Nginx do for me. We are going to see what are the points of strength of Nginx and you are going to appreciate all the things that you are going to be able to do when you're finished learning about Nginx. So see you next. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a new lecture in your course Nginx from Zero to Hero by Idionix. My name is Ahmed and in this lecture we are going to start seeing what can Nginx do for me, why you are learning Nginx. In the previous lecture we have seen several things that Nginx are good for and several things why people are choosing Nginx over other web servers in the market. In this lecture, let's start by seeing the power of Nginx. If you think it's just a web server that proved to be more powerful than other counterparts in the market, you are underestimating it. It can work alongside other web servers like Apache, we have already mentioned that in the previous lecture. It can work as a reverse proxy and we have already discussed what a reverse proxy is, it's a service that stands between the client and the web server. It receives the request from the client and sends it on its behalf to the web server behind it. And when the response is received from the web server, it relays it back to the requesting client. Reverse proxies are used for performance and security reasons. Every feature in Nginx can be activated or deactivated by using modules. A module is just a fancy name for a service that Nginx can provide or a feature that Nginx can provide. This makes it easier for the administrator to work with the required functionality only without having to install any unnecessary functionalities or features that will take on more CPU or RAM or even pose a security risk. Nginx uses the asynchronous way of serving requests. So in a traditional web server like IIS or Apache, a new thread is created for every request received. A thread is just a think of it like a worker that the processor uses for serving or for working with requests. When a processor needs to work with requests, it must create something called a thread for each process. The process will be using the thread until it finishes, and when it is and when it is finished, this thread is available again for other processes to use. So as long as the process is using a thread on the processor, no other process can access this, this thread until this process is finished. That's why modern processors use something called multi-threading functionality or multi-threading technology where a single processor or a single core in a processor can have more than one thread at the same time serving more than one process at the same time. So when IIS or Apache or other web servers receives requests for clients visiting your website, a new process is created for every visitor. And that is why we are suffering from the problem of concurrent connections. So when 1,000 visitors or more are visiting a web page at the same time or a web server at the same time, and you have 1,000 processes dedicated for those 1,000 visitors, if you have another visitor like 1001, this visitor will have to wait until one of the other visitors or until one of the other processes have, has finished. And then, and only then, this visitor can have the service or can visit the web page. Of course, this doesn't happen like a queue the, the, the visitor will not just stand in a queue waiting for the process to finish. He will receive a web page, but it will start loading 
slowly he will start facing difficulty browsing the website he will start feeling that the website is lagging and it is performing slowly that is not the case in nginx there is only one thread but it is based on something called events we are going to discuss this a little more later when we discuss the details of nginx working however you have to understand for now that an events based processing is much much faster than using a single process for every request it does not suffer from the concurrent connections problem and it can handle as much connections as the hardware can take it also allows you to serve many protocols not just http and https you can use nginx to serve imap pop3 and SMTP protocols for mail. It also supports the latest full duplex WebSocket protocol. And when using SSL or Secure Sockets layer, an extra overhead is required by the web server to decrypt or encrypt the content it receives and sends. With Nginx acting as a reverse proxy, you can offload this SSL work to be done on Nginx. The backend web server no longer has to work with SSL encrypted data as reverse proxy will do that. Now let's have a little more explanation of this point. When you use HTTPS, and of course you should be using HTTPS whenever you are serving sensitive content on your website, like for example, credit card information or health information, or if you are hosting a, an e-commerce site or for any other reason that the information on your website is so sensitive, so secure that it cannot be served on normal HTTP. In that case, using HTTPS will incur a little overhead on the server or on the processor because now the data is encrypted. So in order for the web server to be able to work with this, with this data, it has to decrypt it first before being able to use it. And when it sends back the data to the client, it has to re-encrypt it again so that it travels through the network medium in an encrypted manner at all times. So this overhead can be eliminated by installing Nginx not as a web server, but rather as a reverse proxy, as we have discussed previously, a reverse proxy is just a device or a service that sits outside your web server or in, or, or in front of the web server. It handles the SSL request, it decrypts this data, and it sends it to the web server in an unencrypted manner. Then the web server works on this data as if it has been received from an unencrypted source. And of course, it does not have to decrypt it because it is already in an unencrypted form. It does the processing and then sends back the unencrypted data to the to the to the Nginx reverse proxy. It re-encrypts it and it sends it back to the client. So as you can see here, we have lifted part of the work that had to be done by the web server. We have lifted it to the reverse proxy, and of course, this will enhance performance. Okay, and Nginx excels when it comes to serving large files or streaming media. As mentioned, other web servers create a thread for each request. What if the request was to serve a one hour long video or download a several gigabytes long file? That will certainly block the thread until the download or the stream is complete. Several thousand similar requests are enough to make further requests wait in the queue and of course this will make the web server suffer from lagging and performance problems. But with Nginx and because if it and because of its asynchronous nature, this is never a problem, as we are going to see later in this course. Now, let's have a look at the historical question that many people have been asking since maybe since the introduction of Nginx to the world, which is which is better, Nginx or Apache? And I have chosen Apache because it is one of the most popular web servers around the world. It is powering a large portion of the busiest websites of the internet. So once we have Nginx, once we learn Nginx, so should we switch completely to Nginx? Should we just drop Apache? Should, should we just completely rebuild our infrastructure using Nginx uh, as a web server instead of, of Apache? And this slide is the answer to this question. A common misconception is that Nginx and Apache are totally interchangeable and that Nginx is just an enhanced web server. So once you learn it, you should drop Apache and start using Nginx instead. This couldn't be more wrong. Most of the time, you will see Nginx working side by side with Apache. Sometimes we have to use Nginx solely in areas where only Nginx can operate, like we have discussed previously when you are serving large files or when you want to use it as a reverse proxy or for other uses that we have discussed. And some other times you will have to use Apache. It all depends on the type of project you are working on and what you are trying to accomplish. In this part, we have a quick look at the technical and historical differences between Nginx and Apache. Apache was developed in the mid-90s and it's still having a larger market share compared to other web servers. 
EGINX was introduced, as we have said, in the early 2000s, and since 2008, it's gradually taking away the market share from Apache. So it's growing, it's taking a lot of clients and a lot of users from Apache, but still Apache has the larger, the larger market share of all other web servers. Apache creates a separate trial process for each request. Each process uses a blocking thread. That means Apache falls short in performance when it comes to serving a considerably huge number of concurrent connections. Nginx, on the other hand, avoids this problem by creating multiple non-blocking worker threads. Each is able to serve thousands of concurrent connections. Because of the way Nginx is designed, it requires fewer hardware resources than Apache. However, Apache is more popular on operating systems than Nginx. For example, all Linux flavors have Apache available in their official repositories. And think of a repository if you haven't, if you haven't worked with that before. It's just like a software packages directory like roughly like Microsoft Market or Apple Store, but it is for Linux. On the other hand, and while it is easy to download and install, Nginx still requires some tweaking on the OS side before it can be installed using package management. In all cases, of course, you can compile software from source as we are going to see in the next section. Nginx can act as a load balancer and or a reverse proxy, having multiple Apache web servers in the back end and using one or more Nginx servers in front of them as a reverse proxy will give you the best of both worlds. Apache alone does not have this capability. So as you can see here, Nginx can complement Apache and actually most of the time and in most successful scenarios, Nginx and Apache are used side by side, hand by hand in complex environments where Apache handles the web server part and Nginx handles the reverse proxy part. And also Apache has a long history of supporting dynamic content languages like PHP, Ruby, Python and others. Nginx, while it does support PHP natively, will require some extra effort from your side as the administrator to get things working. There are subtle differences between both web servers when it comes to configuration. Apache translates the URL to a file path on the underlying OS. For example, if you have a look at a website like www.example.com slash plants slash fruits slash apples slash rad.html, this would be interpreted by the web server as requesting a file that is called rad.html that should be located somewhere on the file system, specifically on slash var slash www slash html, which is the web root by default for Apache. This is where Apache starts searching for files slash plants, slash fruits, slash apples, and it should find a web page or, a or an HTML file that is called red. This is how Apache works. On the other hand, Nginx does not work like this. It parses the URL in a different way. That makes placing an H and .ht access file, for example, in the plants directory, let's say, to deny users from hot linking image files, is totally useless to Nginx. We're going to see in detail these differences when you go on through this course. There is a huge difference between both web servers when dealing with modules. Modules are a way to add extra functionality to the, to the server. For example, the UI module in Apache enables a server to interpret a request like, for example, www.example.com slash users slash John Doe as www.example.com slash index.php question mark or query string users slash John Doe. So using the rewrite module, Apache can interpret the first URL here that ends in slash user slash John Doe, which is sometimes referred to as pretty URL because it does not have special characters like the question mark. It interprets it or it translates it to a URL that is understandable by the web server. It does contain query strings. It does contain special characters. This is a module that can be activated in Apache by simply removing or uncommenting the line that activates this module or that activates this functionality. But with Nginx, things are not that easy. If you want to enable a module, whether it is provided by Nginx natively or whether it is a third-party module, you will have to recompile Nginx from source. And don't be intimidated. This is not as difficult as it sounds. In the next section, we're going to see how we can do this in detail. So, uh, as it, so as time passes, you won't find it that difficult. Now, this brings us to the end of this lecture and to the end of this section. In the coming lecture, we are going to start actually deploying or installing Nginx on CentOS and Ubuntu. We are going to use different ways to install Nginx. We are going to use the pre-compiled binary scenario where you just download and install the binary from Nginx.org. And we're going to also have a look at the more complex way of installing it by compiling it from source and the immense control that you have when you compile it from source. So until then, see you next.
Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a new lecture in your course Nginx from Zero to Hero by Avionix. My name is Ahmed and in this section we are actually going to start installing Nginx on our servers. I know that the previous section was all theoretical and I'm sorry if you got bored of it. In this section I promise you we're gonna get our hands dirty and we're gonna start actually typing commands on our command line and doing lots of fun stuff. So let's get started. Now before we start we have to have a look at the different installation methods that we have at hand. In Nginx we have two ways of installation, either to download and install the pre-compiled binaries or to compile it from source. The advantages of using pre-compiled binaries is that it is very easy to set up, just one or two lines of code on the command line as you're gonna see and Nginx is installed. However sometimes you are obliged to, com to compile Nginx from source and those reasons may differ from one user to another, but we are gonna list the most common. Although Nginx is widely supported on well-known Linux distributions, you may be working on a system where there are no pre-compiled binaries available. Accordingly, you will have to compile it from source files. And as mentioned in the previous section, Nginx is modular by design. This means that enabling or disabling modules is done by specifying the appropriate command line options in the compile command as we are going to see in this section. Both of those methods will be discussed now. So let's have a look at common prerequisites for the pre-compiled binaries installation. And as we said, the pre-compiled binaries installation is as easy as just downloading the package from nginx.org and installing it. However, before you can do that, there are some tools that are not mandatory to be installed if you want to work with Nginx, but they are recommended that you have because they are going to aid you in lots of your work post installation. These are Lynx. Lynx is a text based web browser. It will aid you in situations where you want to check whether or not the web server is running through the CLI. And we're gonna, we, and we're gonna also have to use the wget, which is a tool used to download files from the internet using. HTTP, HTTPS, or FTP, it's just a download tool. Maybe you're gonna use it to download a newer version of Nginx or a module or for some other reason or another. And finally, Vim or Nano. This is the editor that will be used to work with various configuration files through your work with Nginx. Whatever you prefer, some people prefer Vim, some others prefer Nano. Whatever you need, just install it and make sure that you have an editor working on your system before starting to work with Nginx. So for this lab, I have prepared two machines. One of them is Ubuntu based. I have Ubuntu on, actually this is CentOS. I have CentOS on one of my machines and the other one is Ubuntu. These are the IP addresses of the machines. Okay, and I am going to install the prerequisites on both of them as I'm going to install Nginx in both installation scenarios, both using the pre-compiled binaries and also using compiling from source on Ubuntu and on CentOS. So the first thing we're gonna do is that we are going to install the prerequisites that I have just mentioned. So on CentOS it is yum minus y install and you hand it the list of the prerequisites that you need. So we're going to install wget links and vim. I personally prefer using vim over nano but of course if you prefer nano you can just replace this with nano and just hit enter and it is going to download those packages depending on your internet connection it might take a few seconds or a few minutes okay now all the packages have been installed successfully on my CentOS machine let's clear the screen and let's head to my Ubuntu machine and I'm going to issue the same command but of course when working with Ubuntu I can't use yum I'm going to use apt-get and because I'm working as a non-privileged and as a non-privileged user on Ubuntu, I'm using my own username. So I will have to use sudo before using apt-get. So it's sudo apt-get install. Again, we need links wget and vim. Let's hit enter and enter the username and enter the password. Okay, and it is asking me whether or not I want to install. I press yes, and I will leave it to download the packages and install them. Okay, now the packages are installed on my system. Let's clear the screen and let's start with the first lab in this section, which is installing Nginx on CentOS 7. In this lab, we are going to use CentOS 7 installed on VirtualBox. You can use VMware Player or whatever virtualization platform of your favor. You can also use a physical standalone server for this lab. You can download VirtualBox from virtualbox.org and CentOS 7 from CentOS.org. So before starting this lab, let's have a look at the infrastructure that I have at hand. I have here 
CentOS 7 running on VirtualBox. This is VirtualBox installed on my Mac. Okay, you can download it from virtualbox.org. It's an excellent software and it's a free use. It allows you to install virtual machines on your own machine instead of having to, of course, purchase separate servers, separate physical servers. And of course, this will be costly and will be money efficient. It allows you to create, as you can see here, any number of virtual machines and with any operating system with virtually all supported operating systems and all common operating systems like Linux and Solaris and Windows and others. And you can, can communicate with those machines through the command line or through GUI, depending on your client. And of course, you can use those machines for testing or for whatever reason you want to. In our case, we're using them to install and work with Nginx. So here in our CentOS machine, we are going to add a repository necessary for installing Nginx and a repository in the Red Hat or the CentOS world or and also in Ubuntu with a different, maybe with a different, with, with a different naming. It all refers to the same thing, which is that the container that the system uses to download and install different packages that it needs. So in our case, we are going to add a repository for Nginx. To do that, we are going to edit or open a new file in slash etc slash yam.rebus.d and we're going to give this repository a name. Of course, the most common name that we're going to use is nginx.repo and it should have this .repo at the end so you can choose whatever name you need. So it might be nginx or nginx web server or whatever name you desire. The most important thing is that it has to end with .repo at the end. Let's press enter to open a new file and inside it we are going to write this text. Nginx, this is the name of the repository. Give it a name. This is the friendly name that will be appearing in your yum install commands. So we're going to give it a name like Nginx repository, naturally. And then we're going to give it the base URL. This is the URL that the yum command will use to fetch or to search for the new packages and download those packages from there. It's HTTP colon double slash index.org slash packages slash centus slash seven slash dollar sign base arc and base arc here if you are not familiar with yum it means that it is going to download and install the packages that are suitable for your architecture and the architecture is whether your system is running on 32-bit or on 64-bit processor okay, or, or architecture type, okay, so this is just to make sure that you download the appropriate packages for your system. Next thing is that we are going to specify GPG check is false, we don't have, we won't want it, we don't want it to check for the, GPG, for the GPG key, and we are going, of course, to enable it, to enable it, so enabled is one. That's all what we need, we are going to save this file, and then we are going to issue yum minus y install nginx and as you can see here in a few seconds it has installed nginx on the system if you want to verify that this installation was successful all, the, all what you have to do is just type nginx like this as you can see here when i press tab it gave me nginx and nginx hyphen debug this means that i do have now two commands that are available if i type nginx minus v small case i will see that it has nginx version nginx slash 1.10.3. This is the latest version of Nginx available at the time of this recording for CentOS systems. If I use the uppercase V, I'm going to see a little more verbose output. It will give me the type of compiler that was used to build this version of Nginx. And also take a look here at the configure arguments that have been used in this installation or in this compilation take a close look at this configure arguments i want you to have a look here i want to even pause the video and keep a close look at this at these arguments at these command line options because we are going to use a similar set of command line options when we compile nginx from source of course we're not going to use all these command line arguments but we are going to use some of them i just wanted to have a look at them and to try to understand because most of them are self-explanatory, like for example, hyphen hyphen prefix equals slash edc slash nginx. This is the directory under which the configuration files of nginx will reside. The sbin path, this is the directory where the binary of nginx will be installed. 
the modules path, the conf path, and so on and so forth. Most of the command line options or the configure options are self-explanatory. However, we are going to go through them or through or through some of them when time is due. Just make sure that you have a good look at these command line arguments before we head on to the next scenario, which is installing Nginx on Ubuntu. Now, on our Ubuntu system, we are going to do a similar thing to what we did on our on our CentOS server. We are going to add a repository, but in Ubuntu is called App Sources, just a different naming, but they're basically the same functionality. And again, we're going to use sudo for this to work because this needs to be done as a root user. So I'm going to edit slash edc slash apt slash sources dot list. Opening it, I'll find a large list of sources. I'm going to just head to the end of this file and start a new line and type deb and then give it the URL of nginx.org that is for serving packages or for providing packages for Ubuntu. So it's nginx.org slash packages slash mainline slash Ubuntu. And then as the format of this file requires, I'm going to type the nickname of this version of Ubuntu. It is Ubuntu server 16.10. And I'm going to give the name of the package, which is Nginx. I'm going, to duplicate, I'm going to duplicate this line and just add source or SRC after deb, like this. And that's all what I need to add Nginx to my list of app sources on Ubuntu. The next thing I have to do is that I need to download the key that will be used for authenticating Ubuntu, that will be used for verifying that I have downloaded the correct version or the correct file for Nginx installation. It's just a check for integrity that is done by Ubuntu. So I will need to use wget, and as you can see here, I'm using wget, which I've installed previously. nginx.org slash keys slash nginx underscore signing dot key. Okay, and now the key has been downloaded successfully. I need to install this key using the simple command of sudo apt key add and give it the name of the key that you have just downloaded nginx underscore signing dot key and in a few seconds it's going to be complete and then i'm going to issue sudo apt get update in order to update my app sources with the newly added nginx source as you can see here it's adding the packages that are has been that have been found in the nginx source and now Let's clear the screen and issue sudo apt get install engine x just like that. And press yes for this question. Let it download engine x from its app source. Now the installation has been completed. Let's clear the screen and as usual to verify the installation, we are going to issue engine x minus v small will give you the less verbose information about the Nginx installation. If we used minus V capital or in uppercase, we're gonna see more verbose information about the installation that we did. As you can see here, we have version 1.10.1 of Nginx. We also have the compile time options, the configure options that have been used with this version of Ubuntu. And again, take a close look at these options because we are going to use some of them when we install or compile Nginx from source and that will be the topic of our next lecture, so see you next. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a new lecture in your course, Nginx from Zero to Hero by Ionix. My name is Ahmed, and in this section we are experiencing the different methods or scenarios where you can install Nginx on your local system. In the previous lecture we have seen how we can use the binary pre-compiled method of installation on both the Ubuntu and the CentOS operating systems. Once the installation is complete, Let's have a look at the files and directories that got created as a result of this installation. As we can see, the slash edc slash nginx will contain the configuration files. Let's have a look at them. So whether you are in Ubuntu or in CentOS, it won't matter because both of them have the same directory for nginx configuration. As you can see, if you have an ls minus l for slash edc slash nginx, you will have here a look at all the configuration files that the installation has placed in this directory. The nginx.conf is the main configuration file. This is the one that we'll be using to configure various directives and 
options on features of Nginx. We have also other files located in this directory and they are all used for various configuration options of Nginx. The binary that starts the daemon or the binary that is used to start the process itself is located under esr slash sbin and of course it is called Nginx. And in order to use this binary, you must be locked in as root. So in order to start or stop Nginx, you will need to be root user or you will need to use the sudo command in order to be able to work with this file. And the web directory that Nginx uses to serve HTML files, the directory that its counterpart in Apache is slash var slash www slash HTML. In Nginx, it's located under slash usr slash share slash Nginx. So you can see here I have a directory called HTML, same way as in Apache, and I have an index.html. This is the default file or the file that contains the welcome message that we're going to see when we visit our Nginx page for the first time, and that is what we are going to do in a few seconds from now. Let's just have a look before that at the various log files that are present in that are provided by Nginx. They are located in slash var slash log slash Nginx. And as in Apache, we have an access.log file and an adder.log file. The access.log file will log all the requests that are made to your web server, whether they succeeded or they failed. And the adder.log will contain all the adders that have been encountered when serving various web pages and various web resources by Nginx. Now it's time to have a look at the web page or the, the, the welcome page or the default page of Nginx. Before we do that, we have to first start a service. So we need to use sudo service nginx start. Okay, and let's have a look now at the IP address of our machine in order to use it to access this web page. It's 192.168.1 and 106. Let's have a look at our browser. Okay, and let's close this console and head on to 192.168.1.106. One oh six, and as you can see here, I have the default page or the default welcome page of Nginx appearing on my screen, indicating that I have successfully installed Nginx on this machine. I can also ensure that the similar thing have been done on the CentOS one. Let's clear the screen and again let's issue service Nginx start. Okay, and let's have a look at the IP address that this server has. It has one nine two to one six eight. 1.111. Let's head onto the browser, open a new tab, and again 192.168.1.111. And okay, you have your problem. You cannot connect to the web server or to Nginx on this machine, and that is because I have the firewall enabled by default on CentOS. So, in order to enable traffic to flow to the web server on port 80, you will have to issue a couple of commands. To instruct your firewall that you need to download that you need to accept this traffic. So you are going to issue firewall cmd hyphen hyphen permanent hyphen hyphen add hyphen port equals 80 over TCP or slash TCP. Press enter and then you're gonna issue firewall hyphen cmd hyphen hyphen reload in order to put these new rules into action. Then if you have a look again. On the web page and hit try again you're gonna see that you are able to access the web page it is giving you exactly the same message that have been displayed on the ubuntu web server or the ubuntu machine welcome to nginx so this proves that we have successfully installed nginx on both the ubuntu machine and the centos machine now let's head on, now let's head on to the next part of this section in which we are going to install nginx using the more complex version or the more advanced version of installation which is compiling it from source. Now before we do that we need to roll back this installation. Of course I can do an uninstall of Nginx but I prefer to go to VirtualBox and restore the machine to the way it was before I installed Nginx. This is the more preferred method for me so I'm going to shut on to shut down both servers first. So I'm going to issue power off on the CentOS machine. And also, let's clear the screen, sudo power off on the Ubuntu machine. Okay, now they are both powered off. I'll have to go to snapshots. And I'm going to revert back to the snapshot where I did not have 
Nginx installed here and here. Now once done, I can start the servers again. And if I head back to my command line and log it again to the server here and let's clear the screen and log back to its CentOS. I can see that Nginx is no longer installed either here or here. Okay, it took some time to reply because it's giving me the uh, option to install Nginx. This is a feature, this is a nice feature in Ubuntu. When you type a command that is not found, it automatically searches for the app sources that, or the package sources that are available in the system and it suggests that you could install the package that fulfills the command that you want to run. In our case, we don't want to install Nginx from pre-compiled packages. We already, we already did that in the previous lecture. And let's now install it from source. Now, installing from source is a lengthy process. It's going to take some time, actually longer than the time it took to install the pre-compiled packages. And it also requires a few more steps to um, fully work correctly. So let's have a look at those steps in detail. Now, I'm going to use Ubuntu first as the installation machine. So in order to install Nginx from source, so the first thing we're going to do is that we are going to download the source for Nginx from the Nginx.org. Let's open a new tab and go to Nginx.org slash en slash download dot html. And heading there and heading here, we have here two types of versions. We have the mainline version and we have this stable version. Okay, we're going to choose the stable version. Copy link location, head back to the server and using wget, we're going to download this file. It is a tar.gz file, a compressed file containing the source files for Nginx. We're going to do the same thing on our CentOS. So wget, okay, wget is not installed because we have restored the machine to its previous state. So let's quickly install it. Clear the screen and again issue wget download for the file. Okay, the file has been downloaded here and it's still downloading here. Okay, the file has finished downloading. Let's untar it by issuing tar minus xvf command, which will uncompress the directory, which will, which will uncompress the file into its uncompressed contents. Let's head inside Nginx and now we can, we can start installation but only when we install the prerequisites. The prerequisites for installing Nginx from source are very simple. You need to install the build essentials. The build essentials in Ubuntu is the package that contains the C compilers along other packages that are used in any software building process or any software compilation process, which is our case. So we need the build essential we also need something called the Perl compatible regular expressions. They are needed by Nginx for various scenarios, including URL rewriting. So we are going to add lib pcre3 and lib pcre3 hyphen dev for development version. And also we need to install the open SSL library for HTTPS serving. And the HTTP and the and, and and the connections or the traffic that is going to flow through the OpenSSL protocol or the SSL protocol. Let's also install the OpenLib SSL hyphen dev. Okay, so those are the prerequisites for installing or compiling Nginx from source on Ubuntu. And actually, the same prerequisites will go will be installed on CentOS, with the exception of the build essential package, because on CentOS it's called the development tools, but the other things are basically the same. We'll need to install also the PCRE or the Perl compatible regular expressions and also OpenSSL with its development package on CentOS. Now let's press yes and let's leave them to install. And in order to save time and while they are installing, we can have a look at the CentOS. We are going to do with the same thing, yum-y group install development tools. This is the equivalent of build essential in Ubuntu. So let's press enter and it is going to install a list of packages. All of those or most of them uh, will be used in the installation process of Nginx and they will be useful if you want to compile any other software from source. 
They contain a lot of useful development packages. Let's head back to Ubuntu and it has completed the installation. So now it, we are ready to start installing from source. And that will be the topic of our next lecture. So see you next. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a new lecture in your course, Nginx from Zero to Hero by Idionix. My name is Ahmed and in this section we are discussing various options and various scenarios by which you can install Nginx on your local machine. In the previous lectures we have seen how we can install Nginx from the pre-compiled packages both on CentOS based computers or servers or an Ubuntu or Debian based computers. And in the previous lecture we have started examining the manual way of installing Nginx which is compiling it from source. We have already installed the prerequisites that are needed for this operation to work successfully. Now before we start actually compiling from source let's have a quick look at what the operation entails. In Nginx compilation the .configure command is the one with the most concern. Combined with several command line options you can enable or disable modules and you can also change a lot of the default behavior of the server. For example, Nginx by default uses a user called Nginx with a group called with a group of the same name. So the user is Nginx and the group is Nginx, and that is the owner of the daemon. Now, when the daemon starts, and again we said that the daemon is a fancy name for a service that works in the background. So Nginx, when it works in the background, is called a daemon. And this daemon, to start working, it must be owned by a least privileged user. In other words, you cannot use root user or you cannot use the administrator to be the owner of this process because this will pose a potentially very high risk of being attacked by hackers and being and having your server compromised. So in order to be in the safe side, you will have to use a non-privileged user to own this process. This non-privileged user by default is called Nginx with a group of Nginx. So the automatic way of installing Nginx has already created this group for you. It has created a user called Nginx and a group called Nginx and by default it assigned this user to be the owner of the Nginx process. But when you use the compilation mode or when you manually install Nginx, you will have to manually specify that user or you can leave it at the default if you want to. If you want to override the default behavior, you can use for example hyphen hyphen user equals let's say worker and hyphen hyphen group equals let's say worker as well. But of course this user, in order to be used, it has to be created first on the system. So you can just instruct configure to use this user and this group without them being actually created on the system. Failing to do so will give you an error when you try to start Nginx with that option after it has of course finished compiling. For a list of different command line options that can be used with Nginx, you can have a look at the official page which is, which is nginx.org slash en slash docs slash configure.html, this is the page and it has a lot of information about different uses. Let's uh, zoom in and have a look. Like for example, we have already discussed the prefix. We have quickly had a look at it. The prefix is the directory which will keep the server files or the configuration files on which is the most important one of course, which is nginx.conf. And this is the sbin slash path. And this is the sbin hyphen path, which is the path under which the binary will be located by default it's in, it's in slash usr slash sbin in addition to other important parameters most of them can be left at the default without any changes some of them can be changed as you can see here you can enable and of course and also disable modules so as you can see here this option with pol module will enable the pol module and if you want to disable for example the http gzip module which is the module that allows the server to work with compressed data using gzip. If you want to disable this module for some reason or another, you can just use hyphen hyphen without hyphen http underscore gzip underscore module and it will disable this module during this compilation process. And as we have discussed in a previous lecture in this course, disabling unneeded modules is a best practice both for security from the security perspective and from performance perspective. If you have a lot of unneeded modules already installed with the binary, you are risking that you can be attacked but you can be attacked through one of these modules and since you don't use them, they should not have been enabled in the first place. And also it may take the processor a lot of more cycles to process a binary that contains unnecessary modules than to process a binary that contains only the, only the modules that are needed to serve the specific needs of the server. So in all cases, we'll have to pay a close attention to the planning process before you compile and install Nginx from source. You'll have to have a look at those options, or if you want to, you, just, you can just type 
dot slash configure inside of course the internet uncompressed directory internet here it has been uncompressed in the previous lecture to this directory internet hyphen 1.1.10.3 if you issue dot slash configure hyphen hyphen help and press enter you're gonna see that it has all the various options that can be used with that configure of course it has not it of course it does not have the complete or the or the uh, verbose explanation of each and every uh, option here however it may serve as a quick reference for you in case you have forgotten how a module can be enabled or disabled and so on and so forth okay internet also supports any modules from third party vendors and when i mean and when i say third party vendors i mean that those modules were produced by some other developers than the team of internet developers they are not produced by internet and they are produced by third party teams or vendors if you download one of those modules you can install you can instruct nginx to use it or to add it to the binary using also the dot configure command line options as you can see here you can just add hyphen hyphen add hyphen module equal then you pass in the path to the module file now imagine you have downloaded the file and placed it in some path like for example slash temp on your system using hyphen hyphen add hyphen module and passing in the path to this module which is slash temp as we have discussed will ensure that this module is included in the binary that finally gets installed or that finally gets compiled when you issue the make and make install command as we're gonna see shortly now so the first thing we're gonna do before we start uh, issuing this command or we start invoking the dot configure is that we need to add a user and a group to our system this user must be a non-privileged user it has to be as some people call it a system account or a service account a service account is an account that is not normally used for logging purposes so you should not use this account to log into the system even to work with nginx if you want to work with nginx you have to log in with the root account or using the sudo command you can give your account whatever privileges it needs to work with nginx however this user nginx should not be used for anything other than owning the process that nginx uses so let's clear the screen we are here on ubuntu and let's issue sudo group add minus r nginx and sudo user add minus r nginx and minus g nginx okay i think this this, stat, this status i think the syntax here is wrong it's minus r it's hyphen r hyphen g nginx and nginx okay now we have a user if we type id nginx we're gonna see that we have a user with this uid 998 it is called nginx and it has a primary group of nginx this is the user that is going to own the service or the daemon or the process of nginx now with everything in place let's issue the configure command so it is configure hyphen hyphen prefix equals slash etc slash nginx hyphen hyphen user equals nginx this is the user that we have just created hyphen hyphen group equals nginx hyphen hyphen sbin hyphen path equals slash usr slash sbin slash nginx hyphen hyphen conf hyphen path equals slash etc slash nginx slash nginx dot conf hyphen hyphen pid hyphen path equals slash var slash one slash nginx dot pid and if you're wondering the pid file is just a file a regular file that just informs the process or the daemon whether or not it is running because for a daemon to ensure that only one instance of it is running it has to ensure that a previous instance is already running when it's when it starts the first time it creates this file dot pid in some no, in some known location for the daemon and when other process when and, and when the process exits cleanly it deletes this file so if the process is already running and it created this file and another process or another instance of the process is trying to start it will check for this directory for the presence of the dot pid file and if it is present it will just warn the user that no multiple instances of this daemon can start it's just a way to ensure that only one instance of the process is running and nginx needs to know the location at which it's gonna save this pid file in our case it's slash var slash one slash nginx.pid now the coming is hyphen hyphen lock hyphen path equals slash var slash run slash nginx dot lock hyphen hyphen 
error log this is the uh, error log path location the location of the log file that is called error log it will be stored in slash var slash log slash nginx slash error dot log of course all of these set settings can be changed that is the very reason why we are using dot configure to compile from source any of those can be changed but it is highly recommended that you leave them at the defaults unless you have a very strong reason for which you want to change them but for the sake of consistency it they should be they should stay at the default next hyphen hyphen http hyphen log hyphen path this is the access dot log which as we said logs all the requests that the web server receives slash var slash log slash nginx slash access dot log and now we will enable and disable various modules starting with the word with hyphen hyphen with and hyphen then the name of the module so we need http underscore zip underscore static which as we said it is going to enable the server to handle the gzip content so we need that to be there hyphen hyphen with hyphen http stub underscore status underscore module and this is a module that enables you to view the status of the daemon from a web page with hyphen hyphen with http underscore ssl underscore module and this is the module that enables nginx to work with https and the ssl protocol with pcre remember the protocol compatible regular expressions that we have installed in the previous lecture in order to enable various regular expression related features in nginx like the url rewrite with file aio which is which enables asynchronous file access with http underscore real ip underscore module and then let's disable for example so it's hyphen hyphen without the http proxy module which enables nginx to work as a reverse proxy and this is an excellent example of why you should be disabling things that you don't need if you don't need nginx to work as a reverse proxy if you are going to use it just for a web server you should disable the http proxy module again this is for security reasons as well as for performance reasons now why the binary should contain the instructions and code that enables nginx to work as a reverse proxy while running although you don't need it this will cause you precious cycles of the cpu and of course more memory than is needed so if you don't want to use nginx as a reverse proxy just use this command line option or configure option hyphen hyphen without dash http underscore proxy underscore module and you're good to go now if everything is okay this command will re prepare the directory to install and to compile and to install nginx from source if anything is wrong with this command it will give me a warning so that i can correct any typo or any mistakes let's press enter okay and it does have an error here with http real ip module okay and i forgot to add hyphen hyphen so that is a problem let's press enter again and fortunately there is nothing else wrong it will just do some checks on the various components that needs to be installed before you can install nginx and it's finished you can just now type make and and make install to compile and install nginx from source it's gonna take a few seconds okay and it's giving me an error because i forgot to use sudo so i should use sudo okay and now let's clear the screen issue nginx in order to ensure that we have a successful installation nginx hyphen v will give me the correct version nginx slash one dot ten dot three and now let's have a look at nginx hyphen v capital or v in all caps as you can see here i have a different message than the one that appeared in when i used the same command with the pre-compiled binary versions as you can see here it's giving me the configure arguments these are the arguments that have been used when i compiled the system these are the arguments that were used with the configure argument or with the configure command as you can see these are the exact command line options that we used when we compile the program compare this to the 
previous output of nginx hyphen v in capital when we use the precompiled version and you're gonna see that this output is much longer that's why i told you when we issued that command with the precompiled version to have a close look at the output of this command because it's gonna give you a different version of output than the one that we are going to see at, or the one that we are currently seeing with the compiled version that is because we compiled it from source the other one was pre-compiled the nginx team has compiled it for us and it provided the binary file or the binary installer that will just copy the binary into its appropriate location okay now let's do this very same thing on our uh our our centus machine we're gonna take just a copy of this command and that is the beauty of compiling from source which is that you don't have to make anything different we just copy the same configure command can be used now let's store minus xvf the nginx file let's head inside the file clear the screen and issue the configure of course we are running his here as root so we don't have that problem we encountered in Ubuntu when we had to use sudo when we issued make and make install. Okay, and once we untar the file, let's install the accessory prerequisites as we did with Ubuntu open SSL open SSL slash devel. Also, we need the PCRE library and PCRE devel. That's all what we need. Let's leave it to install quickly. Okay, now it has been installed. Let's clear the screen and let's issue the configure command. Okay, now let's clear the screen and issue make followed by make install in order to actually install Nginx onto our CentOS machine. Okay, now let's clear the screen and again issue Nginx hyphen V. It will give us the version Nginx minus V capital will give us the very same output that we saw on Ubuntu. It is giving us the configure arguments to be used in the compilation process of the daemon or the server. Now let's issue service in GenX start. Okay, let's head back to our Ubuntu server and, and because we have compiled Nginx from source, there is no service wrapper for the daemon. We just have to use the normal way or the raw way of, of starting it. Just gonna head to the binary and just execute it sudo usr has been nginx and we're gonna do the same thing on centus uh I, I didn't mention that i have already done the same methods i have already followed the same steps that i have followed on ubuntu i have created the user that is called nginx with a group that is called nginx here on centus before i continued now let's go to user spin nginx and press enter this will start a daemon and i have also added the necessary firewall rules in order to enable port 80 to be open for this service and let's head to the browser and see whether or not internex is working okay let's open a new tab and issue 192.168.1.106 okay that's welcome to internex now the other server was at 111 and as well it's giving me the welcome page to internex that proves that internex has been installed successfully on both servers and that brings us to the end of this lecture and to the end of this section of Nginx from Zero to Hero by Unix. My name is Ahmed. I hope you enjoyed this section and see you next. Thank you.